Welcome, everybody, uh, to the second episode of the Game 4 podcast. Um, it, this episode's topic, what to do if the game that you like isn't popular. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Adam, from Game 4 slash Milkan. Um, and I'm Matt, and I'm a developer. Yeah. So uh, last episode, we talked a lot about um, what Game 4 is and all that kind of stuff and what we hope to do with the podcast because it was kind of a inaugural kind of get started sort of thing. In this one, we're going to talk about a bunch of different things. Um, we're going to talk about our topic that I just mentioned, what to do if you're, the game that you like isn't popular. We're going to get to that in a sec. But to begin with, I think what we'll probably do is probably kind of talk about like what we've been doing in gaming-wise uh, like since the last episode and, and that kind of thing, what's been going on with us. Um, and I think that Matt's going to start. Sure. So uh, one of the first things that I, I'm doing right now is uh, I'm getting into 3D printing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've I've had a 3D printer for a while, and you've just picked up one. And, and yeah, you've there been was really a with it. there was a very nice humble bu- bundle that uh, as a kind of a newish G- DM GM, uh, it was a l- too tempting not to get. And yeah. then it was, uh, I had to buy the printer to go with it. Right. Well, because if you buy the 3D files to print and you don't have a printer, it's almost kind of a waste of time, right? Pretty and much. So yeah, that's the way that you explained it to, to your so wife, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm yeah, like, yeah. Well, I spent $15, so right, I might as so well spend another 300 I was pot committed at that point. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So now I am printing up dungeon tiles like a, like a crazy person. Right. And so you're doing that so that you can use them in your. Your Dungeons and Dragons, right? In my ca- campaign, fifth edition. yep, yeah. yep. So I'm doing you know normal dungeon right now, but uh, there's also caverns and mm-hmm. towns and taverns and all kinds of fun stuff with that. So, what color are you printing them in? I'm using a uh, gray filament right gray now. Gray filament. So that's I mean that makes sense a lot of sense for um, you know dungeons. Yeah. And then obviously you're gonna paint them and all that kind of stuff too. I, mean, I am gonna paint them, mm-hmm. um, but I did gray just so if I really didn't want to paint them, I didn't have to. But uh, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah, if it was like point, bright orange or yellow, that would look weird. And gray, right. at least you could get by with. Right. right. And yeah. if you miss some spots too, mm-hmm. but but you're not new to to miniatures pa- or to painting in general. You've been getting into that in the last year or so. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thanks to you, I uh, yeah, yeah. I I went from saying I can never paint, will never paint, not going to paint, not happening to uh, about a year in. I've got an airbrush now. Yeah. Paint collection. Mm-hmm. Multiple brushes. Well, and you're doing stuff with it too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. I've seen your work. Yep, I'm, yeah. I'm painting stuff. I'm yeah. having fun with it. It's it, it is very relaxing. Yeah, no, that's I'm a, I'm a big fan of that too. Yeah. So I I, d- I thought it'd be stressing, you know, trying to get all the little details, but it's actually very calming and zen like. Yeah, yeah. It's like my own little rate garden. Yeah, no, I can understand that. Um, but yeah, I've got a kill team right now that I'm I'm painting up. Orcs. Orcs. Yeah, orcs for uh, Warhammer Forty Thousand kill team. Um, have you been playing any other stuff lately? I mean, you guys have been doing D&D as well, right? Yeah, D&D. Uh, I did uh, get the chance to play uh, Maze Rats the other day. Um, is that a board game? It is an RPG. Oh. I, I believe it's an older RPG. Uh, just uses uh, D6s. Hmm. And uh, was a quick one shot. Uh, one of our friends, uh, he decided to give me a break as a DM and, and run it. And uh, that was a lot of fun. So, oh, so you got to play in that. Yeah, that, I got to actually run it. play. Okay, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Yep. So nice, nice. Yeah, we ended up uh, burning down the uh, house. Uh, we were supposed to be uh, getting some uh, treasure back, and we uh, lit the place on fire, which uh, gave the uh, DM a little bit of uh, time to uh, scramble to try to figure out how the story had changed because we had done that. Yeah, I've been in games like that myself, where you know, like, you know, like the the the, the person that we think is the big bad guy, or maybe is the big bad guy, or whatever. Um, we finally take them down right. and then everything. And then I remember playing one time and then being like, all right, well, I'm going to cut off his head. <laughs> and then you could see the GM was like, oh, I wasn't planning on that because that guy was coming back. Is right. I, and I right. It, partially, I think it was partially, I, I was maybe metagaming a bit because I kind of knew the GM pretty well. And I was like, mm, I'm going <laughs> to cut this guy's head off. Um, but yeah, no, I, I can see how that works. Yeah, I, we were sneaking through the house and I've, we couldn't figure out how to get around these this one group, so I lit a fire in the other room, and uh, yeah, you need to be able to see. It took care of the problem. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. So. 
But yeah, I you know as a DM, I probably would not have been real happy with it. But, yeah, I uh, can see that. As a player, it was fun and uh, made a good, good gaming experience. I uh, I was actually just playing um, Minecraft recently, uh, just for was, I was done painting for the night. My eyes kind of hurt and stuff, so I was playing some Minecraft, and um, I found this big, huge, giant wooden house, and there were bad guys inside, which I found out later on are a relatively new feature to. Uh, Minecraft, they're called illagers. Mm, yep. They're kind of gray, and they got big noses, and they always make this weird noise. You're kind of always like, mm, 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 and yeah. that kind of thing. As bad villagers do. Right, exactly. Well, they attacked me when I went into their house to look around <laughs> and then killed me, so I was annoyed by that. So then I just spent the rest of my time for the next couple on and off when I would play. I would go and grind until I eventually found some flint and some uh, iron, which you can then combine to turn into a flint and steel, and mm-hmm. then I went and set their house on fire because oh. it was predominantly made out of wood. And yeah. so, you know, that was this is what happens when you mess with me, I guess, in Minecraft. You yeah, know, you would you would think that that kind of game is very but it's it's not. It's it can be so it can be life or death stakes. Right. Like, so yeah. so the game for podcast, the podcast apparently for pyromaniacs. Well, yeah, no, I guess maybe that's the case. It's yeah. it's a uh, uh, interesting Going thing to learn here, <laughs> you know, in episode 2, but there it is. Um yeah, so what have I been doing lately? Well, uh, besides burning down uh, the illagers, I have uh, predominantly been painting and building and playing. Uh, I'm a mainly a miniatures player, a war gamer. Right. Um, games that I've been playing predominantly, like my heaviest rotation, has been Kill Team. Right, right. You've, how many teams are you up to now? <sighs> Gosh, I think I have six. I think I have six Kill Teams built and painted. I mean, I can add to each one because like, mm-hmm. your roster can go up to 20 uh, models. I don't have 20 models in any of them. The most I think I have is my Imperial Guard, which maybe has like 14. Okay. But I've got some that are as low as five. Okay. So, um, and like that's the entire roster. But, um, so yeah, I'm adding to that. uh, But I'm also getting, what else am I doing? I am also right now working on two other games, actually. I'm working on a game called Tanks, The Modern Age. Mm, it's from the okay. same people that do um, Flames of War okay. and Team Yankee and stuff like that. They're yep. at uh, Battlefront Games over in New Zealand. Um, Tanks is a kind of slightly more simplified game than, say, Team Yankee or okay. Flames of War. It's sure. not designed to be a... Uh, it's it, Honestly, it's a little bit more like X-Wing. Okay. There's no people there's no infantry units in the game whereas nice. those other games are have infantry and tanks you just are driving around in tanks you're playing on like a three by three and you are using like cardboard rulers to show to say this is where i'm moving and that's where i'm going that's not the, there's no little dials like you have in x-wing there's no um the the, the rulers aren't like tr- you know curved and all that kind of okay. stuff but it, i can tell just from looking at it how they're like, we want to get into that kind of X-Wing sort of right. area. You still have to build the models. You still have to paint them okay, and all that stuff. Yeah, yep. they're not, they don't come pre-painted like the X-Wing stuff. But I really enjoyed it so far. Um, and I, they came out with it, that game actually three, four years ago maybe, and it was originally World War II, which is fine. Mm-hmm. But when I found out about the new version, which takes place kind of late 80s, early 90s, kind of a alternate history World War Three that never actually happened. Sure. Um, which is what the, the the Team Yankee game is based off of. Team Yankee game is based off a novel, right? Actually, that's alternate history, kind of World War Three. Anyway, so it's like M1 Abrams tanks and Soviet T72s and that type of era, you know. Um, so it's very cool. Plus, there's also helicopters, so I'm looking forward oh, to that nice. too. I don't have any of those built or painted no, yet. Now, can you play the World War Two tanks in the modern, or you know, as kind of like? I don't think you can mix the two together. I think that that would go very, very poorly for the World War Two tanks. What if you have enough, I don't even think it. I don't think that there are enough Sherman M4A ones in the world <laughs> to take on an M1A1 Abrams with six foot of uh, reinforced concrete in the front of it. Not and, with that know. attitude, no. Yeah, well, no, that's true. That's right. So anyway, I've been doing that, and then the last thing, the thing that I need to get done this weekend, um, I need to paint up. Uh, it's like Blood Bowl okay. from Games Workshop, but it's a game called Blitz Bowl, okay. which is also from Games Workshop, but you can only get it at Barnes & Noble. It's kind of like designed to kind of dip their toe, I think, into the normal sort of mainstream okay. kind of market. So it's like a gateway. It's like a, a gateway, yeah, because yeah. you only, like, a normal game of uh, Blood Bowl, you have maybe 13, 14 different models, okay. and this you have six. Oh. And, like, the base game is, like, 40 bucks, and it comes with six orcs and six humans, and it's on a smaller pitch, and it's a lot like Blood Bowl, but it's simplified a bit more and everything sure. like that. And I've got a friend who's painted up 
uh, the orcs, and we're going to be getting together to play, so i got to finish my nice. humans. I primed them a couple nights ago, uh, and so I'm going to try to paint them up real quick on Saturday, or uh, Sunday, sorry. I, I just want to get them done real quickly. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time on them because I kind of need them to go fast, but I'm also always trying to practice new like speed painting techniques and ways sure. to cut corners. So, Any new technique for this one? or um, I used uh, a colored primer okay. from the Army Painter. It's a company called the Army Painter, and uh, it's a blue primer. So in that situation, spraying them with blue primer saves you a step because normally you would spray a primer, and primers mm -hmm. generally in the old days used to come basically black or white or gray. Right. And then you had to then do the base coat color. Like if you were going, doing guys who were blue, you probably primed in, depending on how dark of a blue, maybe white, maybe gray, maybe black even. Right. And then you had to do the base coat over the top of that to make mm -hmm. them blue, and then you started painting from there. Well, if you can just spray blue primer on them, you're already saving yourself a step. So I used that, and um, so far, uh, yeah, I've been really happy with like the surface and everything and the way it sticks. And so, yeah, we'll see how nice. the painting goes after this uh, weekend. But I, like I said, I want to whip through them pretty quickly because I've got a lot of other stuff I, I got to get done coming up. So I'm always trying to find ways to kind of cut. Yeah, you're on the road a lot. Coming I up. will be June will be a lot of on the road. That's very true. That's very true. In fact, so, you're probably on the road right now. Someone's listening. Yeah, no, that's very possibly the case. That's very true. Yeah, <laughs> they might be sitting next to you on the airplane. Um, yeah, maybe. I guess that's possible. Sure. Um, yeah. So I mean, that's I don't know. That's kind of what I've been doing. It's what you've been doing. Um, yeah, really. Have we had any new big updates? We haven't had any new big updates for Game 4. We've no. got some new stuff that's kind of in our yeah, shirt pocket that, that we're moving towards, but we don't. Ha we haven't had a big... Like, we've had updates and bug fixes and things like that. Right, and whatnot, right, right. But, but no yeah, big new features. Nothing officially released out yet. So. Correct, right. So. But we've got stuff coming. Oh, oh yeah. believe us, we've got stuff coming. <laughs> um, okay, so... How about we talk about today's topic? Yeah, so I think we've both experienced times when uh, we really fell in love with a game that uh, isn't one of the popular games. So there's not a lot of people or maybe anybody around us that's playing it. Yeah, yeah. Now, this doesn't necessarily... I found that this doesn't necessarily strike all game genres. Of the four main genres, not that this is four, not five. The four main genres in tabletop gaming, you've got board gaming, you've got... RPGs, you've got collectible card games, and you've got miniatures, wargaming, that yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, in board gaming, because you just need one copy of the game, and you sit down and say, here, we're going to play this game, and you teach somebody, right? unless somebody's already played that game before and gone, I'm not playing that again, that sucks, I don't right. like that game, or whatever, um, you generally can be like, hey, let's play this game, and from what I've, you know, I don't play a lot of board games, but you play a lot more than right. I do. People will be like, no, okay, that's cool. Yeah, generally not. There's there's a few that are kind of outliers. Uh, your legacy games, uh, because of the commitment, or mm. uh, some of the ones like uh, uh, case uh, time stories, where there's a there's a story, you know, puzzle, and once you've kind of gone through that, so finding somebody that hasn't played that puzzle yet, you know, a little bit, but for the most part, you know, you only need that one copy and you can play it multiple times. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, this kind of issue, it seems like, about what's not popular and that kind of thing, seems to be a little bit more aimed towards the other three genres, i got to be honest. Like your, your, your um, what do you call it, your RPGs and your like collectible card games and miniatures a lot of the time because in, in miniatures, you generally show up with an army and then you expect your opponent to show up with an army. Right. So that's kind of a problem. In magic, let's say, or in, in collectible card games, if it's not magic, you go to the shop and say, hey, do you want to play this collectible card game? And they're like, I don't own any right. of those. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's difficult as well. Um, and then, obviously, like in RPGs, in RPGs, again, I think that you can be, you know, I can sit down and s teach you an RPG. We can play, and you don't need to have stuff for it. But I think that sometimes people unless it's at a convention and mm -hmm. you've played RPGs at conventions I before. sure yep. yeah like I've played RPGs I've never played one at a convention before really because no bec well I don't think I could play an RPG unless I knew the people that I was playing with at okay. least a bit mm -hmm. like I would be most comfortable playing with people that I knew relatively well but just playing with complete random strangers I just can't see myself doing that See, I like it because I can do something, and I'll probably never see those people again. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I get that. I do. But, yeah, I, I understand that. Yeah, yeah no, so so uh, 
in that situation, like playing, a, if you are into being able to play at conventions, RPGs, then going to a convention and playing a game you've never played before and will very possibly never play again mm -hmm. is fine. I get that. But if you want to get into a campaign and you want to keep playing, it becomes a big, uh, uh, you know, hurdle. It, well, it becomes a, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm losing it here. The word, it's, um, you're um, putting money into something, but it's not money. You're putting time into it. Investment. Investment. I'm like, uh, inheritance? No, that's not right. It's a game um, show now. Yeah, exactly. It's like a password. Um, no, but it, that's the big trick is that it, it, it's a situation of, you know, I don't want to spend my next three months every Thursday night playing some game that maybe I'm not cool with or whatever the deal is or something along those lines right. or I've never heard of it. It may right. be cool and I might love it, but I don't know about it because it's not one of the big dogs that's always on, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. on, in the in the in the books or in the magazines or whatever on the, on the internet, right. and that can be a real trouble um, for RPGs because people do need to really have some sort of investment, predominantly of time, sometimes right. even money too. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we all know people who've played plenty of a popular role playing game and not even owned, like sometimes even dice you know what right, i mean like right. yeah exactly uh, but i've got plenty of people that i know that play you know f uh you know D D and don't own the player's handbook which i think honestly everybody should if yeah if, if you're playing that you should it, it just it's it's really helpful to be able to look things up when you're not there like when you're obviously sitting down and you're playing with your friends and you can be like hey can i take a look at that real quick or whatever right right but, but when you're not together playing and, and, you, and you can't really get an ownership of that character if you can't you know tweak it and, and design it the way you want right to. and it slows it down i think for everybody else to some degree if you ha only can look at the book when you guys are there getting ready mm -hmm. to play you want to be able to kind of i think at least in the, the campaigns that i've played and it has been years since i've played in campaigns but you want to be able to kind of take care of that stuff Oh, yeah. Offline. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, right now we're doing uh, story-based uh, uh, leveling mm -hmm. in the campaign, one of the campaigns I'm running, uh, which is the first time I've ever done it that way. But uh, when we get to that end of that chapter, that's usually when I end the session and say, all right, and level up your character for next time. Because sure. we could sit around for two hours while, you know, the wizard figures out what spells he's going to take next. But uh, that's not really fun for everybody. Exactly, exactly. And so that's, I mean, you know, there's obviously also in this day and age now, there's a lot more uh, things that you can do as far as, you know, um, well, specifically in D&D, &D, there's D&D &D Beyond, where you right. can do a lot of that stuff kind of on, you know, through a browser on the web and everything sure, like yeah, that. Sure, you can definitely level up a lot faster with that. But, but that goes back to the exact same problem that we're talking about of what if there's game. a game that you like that isn't popular, it probably doesn't have a D&D &D Beyond equivalent. Like, nobody really has a D&D &D Beyond equivalent except for you know Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> right. um, because that's a huge huge undertaking to mm -hmm. build that and it's a money maker and they spend a lot of time and put resources into it and that mm -hmm. makes sense and when you're a kind of newer smaller or not even necessarily newer it could be a game that's been around for a really long time right. but it's not played by as many people so they don't have the money and the resources to put into some sort of like uh, you know uh, company or whatever to, to build them out something like that yep um and that can be problematic. Um, so there's a lot of things that can, you know, and getting back to the miniatures again, it's the same deal. If I show up at a store and I'm like, hey, I really want to play Game X, whatever it is. That's not really a game. I just made it up. But, you know, I want to, could be a game, sure. But I want to play that and I've got my army and I've got all my tree robots or whatever. I'm just making stuff up. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you want to play? And then that person's going to be like, I'm here to play 40K. I brought... Eldar or whatever or something you know I don't know what you're talking about I've never played that game I've never seen it and so if you are trying to you know go to the shop which not every again we kind of talked about like board games like board games a lot of board gamers don't play at the shop they don't just walk into a shop and just plunk down a box and right. go hey any random folks want to play this game some people do yeah and there's board game nights and stuff like that yeah but, but usually not a uh, non-scheduled event exactly but on any given Saturday you can generally be expected to take your magic deck into a game store that at least has people in it and probably get a game of magic. D&D, mm -hmm. um, &D, again, you don't just sit down and play it with random person. 
you generally have to have a group or a thing or whatever. Usually, but, yep. you know, you still can kind of go in that direction. You can still have people who are like, yeah, let's do this or let's figure out like Thursday nights and you want to be able to get that stuff set up while you're at the game store. That's great. But in this situation, again, if people like you're a big fan of Paranoia. Paranoia. Yep. Right. Which is an older game originally. Right, right. Yeah. The the West End games? I believe so. I think it was West End games back then. And in the it's day. uh but yeah, now it's up to the sixth edition that just came out twenty seventeen, mm-hmm. I believe. Yeah. And uh I don't you know, finding someone around here that plays that, you know, at a game shop would be pretty hard to do. Oh yeah, just walking into the game shop and being like, Hey, is anybody here wanna play Paranoia? You're gonna get a lot of no's right. or a lot of question, you know, looks like what are right. you talking about? And that's and that's an issue. So, um, I guess is it important for us to go through and try to like, kind of point out the popular games? Is that even like a necessity? I, th- I, I mean, think everyone knows the popular games. Yeah, I mean or you, you, you've heard these names before, like in D and D or D and D in, in our path. I mean, honestly, yeah. like it's almost like Kleenex. Right, you know right. what I mean. Where you're like, oh, we're gonna get together and play D and D. Oh, really? Like what kind? Oh, we're gonna play Paranoia. You know, it's almost like right, right. It's, it's not, but it's it's, it's it's in that direction. Whereas, like, are you gonna make a Xerox? Yeah, okay. The Rico photocopier is over right. here. That kind of thing. Yeah, nothing against Pathfinder. Pathfinder is great. But no, yeah, you know, absolutely. But yeah, just because but it was the first and it's the biggest. You know, exactly. That same, you know, and it's gotten huge again. Oh, fifth like, edition. Fourth awesome. edition was really like I. They were circling the bowl, in my <sighs> opinion, to some degree, from a person who is outside of it. I don't know that I ever played a single game of fourth edition i don't think i did yeah so, I, think, um, I think i listened to a few podcasts at the, but right. that was a, that was about it, it yeah was but i had played three and three five and i played like a long long time ago like I, my first non-standard kind of more nerd type game was D D, like in the fifth grade like mm-hmm. that's where i started yep um but yeah like i i never played a game of fourth um, and now that fifth has just kind of taken off like gangbusters, it is the big most popular. In right. The, well, in we even show. had a campaign running for a while in the. We in did the store. here at the here at the at the office. We did um, uh, during lunches for a while. We were doing yeah. that. Um, so yeah, no, it's it is. I would say easily probably the most popular. Like Pathfinder was really popular for a while when D and D didn't know what they were doing. You right. Because they, they were like, basically like, we're going to take what D and D was doing right and just keep it there for a while. You yeah. Know? You know, that, I think that was the original premise behind it. But. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then within in tabletop wargaming and miniatures and stuff, obviously your warhammers, you know, like yep. you're both uh, Age of Sigmar warhammer, which is the more fantasy based, and then the you know Warhammer Forty Thousand, which is the sci fi yep. and all that kind of jazz. They're like the big miniature company right. as far as that's concerned. Star, um, uh, fantasy fights come into it a little bit with Star Wars just because of the because of the license, licensing. probably. Yeah, no. Uh, between X Wing, which was and honestly X Wing brought in a ton of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, like at our local store, there were a bunch of people who were Magic players who got into X-Wing. They didn't leave Magic, but because they could open the package and start playing with it, and it was already painted, right. that was a huge win for those type well, of it's, folks. It's, it, it's, got, it's what got me, and uh, I know a few others that work even here, that uh, it's true. going back to the game store. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, we, we were talking about that in the previous episode, about how a lot of like the app that we're that, that we've got here is kind of predicated on the fact that um, folks here at Milk Can were having a hard time finding people to play X-Wing with. Right. So there's that. Um, as far as the whole situation with um, miniatures though, I mean like yeah, you're, you're, you're it seems like 40k and Age of Sigmar um, are probably the biggest dogs in that industry. Right. If you walk into pretty much any place that sells miniatures you're most likely going to find uh, Games Workshop miniatures Warhammer stuff or at the very least, you're going to find that, or and you'll probably also find people with playing. You'll probably find some terrain and stuff like that, sure. you know, at the shop. And, um, then, and then it's just a mix of what that next popular game is. It seems almost different per store, you know. That's it, true. It's very regional, um, right? You know, like you'll walk into a store and like everybody there who's not playing, say, like a, a, G, a Games Workshop game, uh, it, that's still playing miniatures, might be like you walk into one store and it's Privateer Press, you know, War right. Machine and Hordes, and you're like, oh wow nobody plays that around where I live and they're like really everybody plays it here and then you go to someplace else and they're all playing Malifaux you know there's again the majority the popular is one thing but the these other games that you see pop up within the tabletop wargaming kind of thing and again being regional I think there's some definite and we're going to talk about it in a bit but that is kind of it the the the, the, the group grows based off usually an instigator or two. Yes. And so um, 
yeah, so that's a little bit of foreshadowing right there. Uh, as far as collectible card games, Magic, like that's the biggest. Yep. Again, it was kind of the original. Like they yep. were the ones who sort of invented the whole situation. That was my first, yep. Right. And uh, yeah, I played two back, oh gosh, Unlimited, um, Ice Age, Antiquities, Legends. Yep, like that's, that's when that I was, was playing and stuff yep. like that. And then, and it, it's funny too because whenever I tell anyone who plays Magic that that was back when I used to play, they're always like, "Oh, really? That's really interesting. Do you have any cards? Do you have any the old cards?" Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. always that question. And I'm uh, like, "No, no, I got rid of them all." Um, I, I did find a box and I, I sold them to a Magic player because I just I oh didn't yeah play them. yeah yeah no but, just recently yeah right. you found like a box in your closet it, yeah I figured my mom had got rid of them a long time ago but yeah 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 and it was kind of fun looking through them. yeah no yeah definitely we were we were looking because you brought them in the office um, yeah but so. There are other collectible card games out there, and some bigger ones. Uh, you know, Pokemon's big. Yeah, Pokemon, and Pokemon's got a definite uh, kind of generally age group sort of thing. Yeah, like you kinda, find like I the younger kids right. playing. There, I know it. there's definitely older, but it, yeah, yeah. kind of definitely has that stigma that it's a uh, your you know my first CCG to some degree. Yeah, and and, and but the th- again, there are plenty of people who are older that are playing it because they really enjoy it. Or maybe they play it with their kids, right, or you know that kind of stuff. Or Yu Gi Oh is another big one. Yeah, Yu Gi Oh as well. Uh, Force of Will, which I don't know really anything about other than I've seen it at the shop. Mm-hmm. But there are other ones as well that, again, if like here's the deal: if you walk into a shop and go, "Hey, does anyone want to play Force of Will?" Right. You're very lucky if you find somebody else who's like, "Yeah, I got my deck. Let's play." Unless that's the big secondary game in your area. Right. And if it is, again, foreshadowing, it's because there was some instigators or some some advocates for it. Mm-hmm. Um. So, yeah. And then with board gaming, like, again, like I said, board gaming is kind of different in this area because it's more of a, I own the game, I brought it out, we sat down and played it, there you go. There's not as much investment in time or in money for the other people who are sitting at the table who don't own the right. game. As a general rule, yeah. Right. And now, you know, and we're, you know there's outliers on in every genre. Sure. No, absolutely, absolutely. But like, so what would be some of the most popular you think board games right now? That, uh, that I mean, obviously there's the there's the relatively I, I hate to use the term household names, but you know you've got Settlers of Catan, right? You've got Carcassonne, you've got you know stuff like that. But you're seeing new ones now too. Oh yeah, there's uh, tons. Uh, you know, Scythe, Scythe, uh, um, Terraforming Mars is a big one. Uh, Gloomhaven, because they've got Gloomhaven. Yeah, huge. Clank. I don't know how many editions they've sold out of Gloomhaven, mm. but. Uh, and it also weighs like a thousand pounds. Yes, it pretty much needs to come with its own carrier. Yeah, like one of those extendable ones with the wheels on it, <laughs> like a dolly. Yep. <coughs> Excuse me. So, but let's say, let's say that you like a game that's not one of those games. Mm-hmm. So, what does that what does that do? What does that mean? Well, as we've kind of been saying, when you don't. When, when, like, if you, if you're again going back to my main thing, which is tabletop wargaming, when you walk into a shop and say, "Hey, does there, anyone here want to play, um, you know, whatever Malifaux, uh, Monster Apocalypse, uh, Privateer Press games, like other other Privateer Press games besides Monster Apocalypse, like um, War Machine and Hordes, uh, heck, even Star Wars Legion, you know, Star Wars is like one of the big biggest intellectual properties on the planet, right, and the the Depending miniatures the game shop, yeah. is not taking off as well as a lot of people kind of thought it was gonna. Mm-hmm. Um, I think partially that is due to the fact that it, you still have to build them and paint them, whereas X Wing you just took one of the. Oh bonds. yeah, there's definitely an investment, right? Yeah, again, time and, and money again. Um, so yeah, so you walk into the shop and you're like, "Hey, I want to play this game," and everyone kind of gives you like a a look, like, "What? Well, what are you talking about?" You know, right. because they don't play that because mm-hmm. they just basically play the, the 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 you know the popular game. Um, again. Collectible cards, same way. Again, same with RPGs. But that is not to say that there, A, aren't people out there Mm -hmm. who are interested in the game that you are, and they may even live near you. Right. And they just don't know it. Like, you know, one of the big benefits that we've wanted to put into the Game 4 app was the looking for players so that you can sort of spread this wide net out to all the people in your region but not all the people in your region, not to like to my mom or to, you know, right. like it goes to the people who are tabletop gamers who are also looking at this thing. But mm-hmm. it's going to all the tabletop gamers who might look at this at, at the, in right. the app and go, 
I'm looking to play some stuff and I'm looking through the looking for players section and I want to find out like what game what people are running out there what right. people want to what, what, what people are looking to play it's not an event it's not like oh it happens on Thursday night it's just like I want to play you know paranoia and and, and that's what I did I've, yeah. I've, I've found a few people around us we're still trying to get our first game scheduled but well that, that's kind of a but yeah, RPG I actually, thing. I actually general, found but, people. Right, exactly. You found people in our area, middle of Wisconsin, who wanted to play Paranoia right. because you posted a looking for players yeah. in LFP right. in Game Four. Right. Um, it is very difficult, I feel, in a lot of other. Uh, it's difficult to throw that up on Twitter. It's mm-hmm. difficult to throw it up <laughs> in Facebook. Um, you know, because if you put it, post it on Facebook, generally you're going to get a bunch of people who are on your friends list going, "What? What are you paranoid about? What's right. going on? What's parent? Why? Who?" <laughs> right. And you, you know, your aunt and your 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 grandma or it's whatever. I'm concerned about you. Exactly. Right. Right. But when you put that put that stuff into the looking for players in, in game four, then it makes a lot more sense. So that's one way to do it is to be able to try to find. I mean, there's certainly also just go in into your local shop and talking right. to the employees slash owner or whatever because yeah, they they know who's been buying and what they've been buying exactly. So if you know you just go in and ask them for paranoia, well, they might have just sold three copies of you know in the last edition, couple of months. And or they're whatever. like, yeah, there's people here, so exactly. and they'll tell you here's how. You know, at our store, we usually have people get you know get a hold of each other, or you know, they might even help you get, get a hold of people. Game store owners, they want to sell the popular stuff because they don't have infinite space in mm-hmm. their game store. So they obviously can't stock every single game out there. But they know that if a group of you who are currently not being served, your needs are not being met right. by, let's say, Dungeons & Dragons, mm-hmm. you're just not into it for whatever reason. You're just not that into it. But you're really into Pathfinder, or you're really into Paranoia, or you're really into... Iron Kingdoms. Do they even make that? I don't know if they make the Iron Kingdoms. I don't know if they do. Yeah, but... but you, Doctor, yeah, Doctor Who's... Doctor Who RPG. Uh, RPG. Like, whatever. Cyberpunk. Sure. Oh, yeah, Cyberpunk. I'm really looking forward to the All update the, for that. Coming yeah, up yeah, real yeah. soon. So, yeah, definitely. That kind of thing, they they know that if 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 they can't get you with D&D, and don't, don't take this as like they're trying to get you, but if they can't interest you mm-hmm. in D&D, but you are interested in this other game then they would be glad to sell you the book. And Lord knows I've bought plenty of RPG games in the past, knowing full well I was probably never going to play them. But I just wanted to read them, <laughs> right. and the artwork was awesome, and there's all kinds of cool stuff like that. That's great. But if you all talk to your, your game store owner and go, like, well, yeah, but is anybody else you know, buying this? And they were like, oh, yeah, as a, as a matter of fact, or I've had some people who were interested and have talked about it They're and asked me for questions about group. it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so that can, that can be a great resource as well. The Looking for Players in Game 4... The app uh, can also be a great resource for that type of type of thing as well, um, and that goes across the board. It's not just RPGs; it's also in you know tabletop wargaming, you know miniatures and that kind of stuff. You're going to see that as well, uh, even in collectible card games. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know that's kind of the trick. That's kind of the right. the problem, but yeah, one like of some what, of the solutions, right? You know? Like for CCG when we first started, uh, you and I were talking about KeyForge. Yeah. And we were, went to our local store at mm-hmm. lunch and uh, asked them, well, is anyone even buying this? Yeah. And that's when we found out, oh, yeah, people are buying this like crazy. Yeah. Oh, we, yeah. You know, this is like our second box of it. Yeah. And that's when we're like, oh, okay. Now there are people. So it made us, you know, more confident in buying more and stuff like that. So yeah. And admittedly, at this point, we are still predominantly just for the most part playing our, each other. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I've also, I have played, you know, at the game, sh- uh, the game store with, um, some other folks as well. Yeah, I've, I've done one or two days. At, so yeah, yeah. So y- y- knowing kind of, you know, t- talk to your local store owner and your your store employees and talk to them and say, look, I'm interested in this. Is any because they will tell you also if like nobody has right. ever bought it and it's been sitting on the shelf for a year. Right. They're going to be like, mm, I don't know if that's a really great idea. And 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 that can be also I think also very useful information. In certain situations, there's no reason. That you can't just decide. Well, just because nobody likes it around here doesn't mean that I can't make them like exactly, it. Exactly right. Can force them to like it. Okay, maybe force is a strong word. Um, but that's kind of getting back to the foreshadowing that we were talking about previously, and that is something what we've been for years around here referring to as an advocate, become mm-hmm. an advocate or an instigator. Who's maybe a little bit of a nastier word for it, right. but it, I think it's still apt. Uh, become a, an advocate for your game. Um, on my YouTube channel on Tabletop Minions, years ago I made a video about this very thing, about becoming an advocate for 
uh, certain games. Let's say you're interested in playing. Uh, back in the day, I know I was I, I, I was a big fan of a game called Mercs mm -hmm. that was a miniatures game, and you only ever played with five models. It was a very small kind of skirmish game like that, and it was very cool. Had great artwork, and I loved the models and uh, just liked everything about it for the most part. But it was when it first started, it was two guys. Like it was a very small indie company, and so they had obviously an uphill climb against all the big boys and all that kind of stuff. Sure. And so, um, in the video, I basically said the reason that, like, when you go to certain, like we were talking before, you go to certain regions of the country slash the world, and you say, "Oh, this is really interesting." When I go to this shop, like, obviously, forty k is still like the big thing, or, mm -hmm. or you know, Warhammer in general, whatever. But there's a ton of them also playing BattleTech, or there's a ton of them playing Malifaux, right. or there's a ton of them playing Mercs at this place, and it's because somebody from the shop. Sometimes I've heard people refer to them also as alpha gamers. I don't like that term. I, I, yeah, the, the whole alpha it's, thing yeah, is it's kind used of used a lot. <laughs> but it is. I, I like advocate or instigator. Um, and and what it is is it is a person who's like I'm going to get people to start playing this game. And the way in war gaming in miniatures, when you want to get people playing in this type of game, what you're doing is you are uh, generally trying to buy both armies. You yep. know what I mean? So mm -hmm. if it's a skirmish game, that usually means it's far fewer models. Right. If you were going to be like starting to teach people in your local area to play, let's say, Warhammer 40,000, and you needed to build two 2,000-point armies and paint them and all that kind of stuff, it would be an incredible amount of time, an incredible amount of money, and then trying to teach someone to play this game when they're sitting in front of potentially a couple hundred models, right. that's daunting. That's very daunting for your yes. average person. But when you go, hey, look, this game uses like, I got six guys and you got seven. And I, I painted them all up. They're all ready to go. It's very simple. Right. It was easy. It was two starter boxes or whatever the deal is. And boom, let's let's I'll teach you how to play right. it. And Especially if it comes with like starter rules. I know some of them oh, are yeah. trying to do that as well. Like, here's the you know rules to play the first time that yeah. kind of eases you into the game. And Absolutely, yeah, tons of them do. Um, so with role playing kind of games like that, or sorry, not role playing, um, with war gaming types of games, miniatures and such, becoming an advocate means you are probably going to end up having to buy and, and build and paint two, and I would suggest, small armies. Don't go, again, like the big army games. Right. You know, go with skirmish. The, one of the reasons that skirmish games these days in wargaming are so popular is because you can get th the actual army painted and finished yes, within your lifetime, <laughs> uh, which is a big deal. So, um, yeah, you know, I mean, that kind of thing is important, and if we can get... Uh, you know, if, if you can just sit down and say, I'm going to put these two forces together and then, you know, go to the local shop and if someone's saying, hey, you want to learn this? It won't take super long. And then just have them pick. Just right. have them look at the models and go, oh, I like to look at those guys. And like, yep. okay, cool. You use those guys. I'll use these guys or right. whatever. And then go from there. Um, and then you can hopefully teach them. And if they are interested, maybe playing again later on, maybe you guys get together you know, next weekend or something like that, yeah. and then maybe they eventually order some of those models from the, the right. shop, or they sw or just swap armies. Right, that's a good point too. Yeah, exactly. You can get together and and play the first time with these two armies, and then be like, okay, cool. Well, now what if you play the army I played and I play the army you played, right. and then you can kind of see from both sides. Um, that is a way to be an advocate for a specific miniatures game, let's say that mm -hmm. you're trying to get in your local area. How would you become a uh, an advocate you think for say like um, like uh, for RPGs and that kind of stuff yeah RPGs I would say kind of the in, you know instead of a skirmish uh, you know the skirmish equivalent for an RPG is really your one shots so you know your big 40k army is your campaigns that you know can drag you know go on years sure oh absolutely but a one shot is traditionally done for you know and the hopes of getting it done within like a two to six hour window but basically a one a one time sitting down. It's kind of the same thing as playing an RPG at, at a convention. Right, yeah. Traditionally most of your RPGs at conventions are one shots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, usually the characters are generated or you have a quick method to generate the characters and customize it slightly, but traditionally they don't have to go sit there with a handbook and, you know, figure out what their players are, mm -hmm. what abilities are and you know, powers and all that stuff. They you know, they can pretty much sit down and ready to go. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you do you feel and then again being a person who's played actually at conventions uh, played RPGs at conventions mm -hmm. have you been swayed away because you've never heard of the game 
no usually that's when i uh, that's the time when i'm like oh i'm gonna give this a try i've yeah. seen this on you know the bookshelves at my local game store mm -hmm. or i've seen a podcast mention it or a youtube video and that's my chance to kind of sit down and get exposure to that game to really see well now that i can sit down and play it you know do i like it yeah basically kicking the tires at that situation yeah exactly yeah yeah i think that it's it's important for uh yeah especially with rpgs because if you do get into it even somewhat and there are some people who only play one rpg mm -hmm. like ever that's all they've devoted their right, time right, to right. but there are also groups that hop around oh like yeah. they'll do s shorter campaigns right and then get done and then switch over to vampire the masquerade and then right. they switch over to starfinder and then they switch over mm -hmm. you know or whatever um and and that's just the way that the group dynamic works right yeah like each group works different and, and and especially for ones where there's you know uh, one person's always the dm mm -hmm. like i said you know giving that dm a break and running you know a game that you're interested in that maybe you played at a convention learned how to play it and you can rerun that for everybody else yeah yeah no i agree i think that um I think that that can be a big benefit for getting. Now, there's a bit of a difference between obviously role playing and 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 say miniatures in that um, a miniatures game, in theory, to some degree, can build kind of a community. Let's say based around a shop, sure. because you have a tendency to play at shops a lot. Mm -hmm. Not always. There's plenty of people who never go into a shop at all. They just play miniatures. They, you know, whatever, and they in their, in their basement or their garage or mm -hmm. with a group of four or five friends or maybe even two or three or even one. And that's fine. Um, but if they do want to kind of spread out, then they have a tendency to gravitate a little bit more towards the shop if they have one in their local area. Exactly, yeah. And then that w allows them to kind of maybe find out about new games or to bring people into their game and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. With RPGs, you see RPGs played at shops from time to time. Mm -hmm. But I would say probably that a lot more of that is happening in people's houses. Yeah, I think, you know, the or time commitments. Clubs, maybe. Yeah, time commitment, space, noise. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that, yeah, I think kind of factors into that, but... Uh, yeah, no, I agree. So in that situation, then, I think, um, you know, it's not that it builds a community as much of all of a sudden tons and tons and tons of, let's say, for example, paranoia players in a local area. Right. It's more along the lines of, I just want there to be a decent sized group that so I can that, play. So with. I can play that, you know, play that... I can DM it I or whatever. Or yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and that's another benefit. So another... Uh, thing that I, I you know being an rpg or having someone to run the game mm -hmm. you know that you're interested in is also sometimes a task yeah oh absolutely and, and that's where a one shot you know that's how i started to gm dm uh myself was running one shots because there's a lot less you know almost on you as to you know have a full flushed out world and you know you're a little bit more on the rails at that point and have a smaller universe of where you're going with that everything. right so. no i totally see that um i think then uh with collectible card games and that kind of a thing it kind of goes back almost to some degree to the same model of the um like the miniatures games in yeah. that you have a a community that's happening a lot at the shop mm -hmm. there are plenty and this is very interesting to me years ago i went to a seminar that was put on uh it was aimed towards retailers i was there with a friend of mine who's a retailer and i was at this event and um there was a seminar that was being given by a guy who worked at Wizards of the Coast. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And he told us, he told us, a f uh, 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 and this is all predominantly store owners who were sitting sure, in there and, yeah. and receiving this information. And he told us something that he, that made the majority of the store owners in that group gasp. Okay. And he said that through the 25 years that, that, that Magic has been around, that they've been tracking and doing surveys and trying to actually find out where people play and all that kind of stuff. Um, he said that as, as far, far as they can tell, as much as 95% of Magic players mm -hmm. never play an event in a store. Really? Yeah. Which store owners in that room literally did gasp, and they were like, that doesn't sound right. And, and it, it, he was like... We've been doing surveys, and, and that's because I think that, yeah, you go to the local shop and you see Friday Night Magic. Obviously, sure. that's every Friday night and that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff and all these different tournaments and pre-releases and all that jazz. But I think that you – I think that there's tons and tons and tons and tons of little enclaves of people who right. are like four people who just draft together and play. Right. Like they go to the shop and buy the stuff, mm -hmm. or maybe they go online you know, or something like that right. or whatever. 
but they just draft and play at their at their house right or they or whatever they do and, and there's probably an age thing as well or oh certainly know, yeah like you know i know my son is part of a pokemon club at school mm-hmm. because they're probably not going to be driving exactly you know sixth graders don't usually drive yeah not too many not, not on purpose <laughs> but um yeah so that that's kind of an issue there too but if you do like to go to your local store and get into games and play there again you kind of have to become an advocate and go okay well i want to see if we can get four people to play force of will you mm-hmm. know and do that and maybe we'll do a draft or something like along those lines um but you're basically bringing everything with you at that point to some degree yeah i mean i know i don't know i'm not a again i'm not a big magic player but i've heard about something called a cube draft and i believe that's like you bring a certain amount of cards together that you've just already had and then everybody kind of drafts the cards that okay. are already in this big pile and then you so so nobody really other than the one person generally has to have like sure. you bring the cube and then everybody gets together and plays i don't know i'm probably making some magic players in the audience They're uh, cringing right now exactly which is fine i get that but that type of idea where i'm going to bring all the cards and then we're going to kind of do something with it at that point it becomes almost a little bit more like a board game you know or like a card based right. board game you know that type of thing right um, living card game, perhaps one of those yes. things, but yeah. So you know, but if you want the local, if you want tournaments and that kind of like actual events to happen in your at, you, in your local store meta or whatever for right. some game that's maybe not Magic, something else, right? You're probably going to have to try to again become an advocate for mm-hmm. that, and you're going to have to maybe try to get a draft together, get people together. You could post events at your local store in Game Four that people could see who yep. maybe don't even go to that shop too frequently but they've been thinking about Keyforge for a while mm-hmm. and it's going to be maybe because Keyforge is a bit of a different game in that there's no boosters you just buy the deck right. and the decks you don't build the deck it's just you bring it's it 36 you. cards right I think it's 36 cards it's and that's, been a little bit since I yeah I think it's 36 cards it's like 10 bucks and it's 36 cards and the deck can't be modified mm-hmm. um, that's one of the things I personally like a lot about Keyforge is the fact that there's no deck building because I'm terrible at deck building so and I don't enjoy it, but um, getting together and getting people to do that, like you could say, if the shop's not already like having events for KeyForge, you could say we're going to have a KeyForge, you know, whatever they call it. It's not a booster. Uh, uh, there's the type of games uh, tournaments right. where you get a certain amount of boosters and then you play based off of the stuff you've got in those boosters. Yep, it's kind of like that where you buy a deck and then you play right. with that deck. Yep, which is the way the KeyForge was designed. But then that way the store owner looks at it as like, well, at least I'm going to sell probably at least four decks because you're right. having like a Brand thing, new decks, yep. you know, and that's cool. And then people are playing with new stuff and things like that. But if the store's not finding, some stores are more proactive than others. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if the store is not very proactive, then there's going to be the case in which you're going to be like, all right, well, I'm going to then become the advocate and yep. say, I want more people to be playing Keyforge, for example, in my local shop. So therefore, I'm going to go into game four and I'm going to say, cool, I'm having an event on Saturday and it'll be do this stuff. You know, I would generally talk to your store owner and say, is it cool? Yeah. Is there other stuff? Yeah, I mean, definitely don't show up with 40 people on a, on a bus. And, right, exactly. And expecting to buy, you know, a bunch of Keyforge decks. Right, exactly. No, that's the case. But that type of thing, taking that kind of initiative can help you get these types of things firing off in your local area. Um We've even talked in the past, well, I've talked in the past because I've, I've done it for years, about running a local convention. Um, if you want there to be certain types of games, mm-hmm. um, then either, well, not, I'm sorry, not running a local convention. That's a whole different uh, episode. Yes, right. Running this game at a local convention. Right. So if you go to a local convention that, that, that has, you know, don't go to a convention that is all Magic players. And then say, "Hey, I'm going to run 40k, yeah. 40k, right? Yeah, first time, like yeah. you know, either kind of try know to your audience a little yeah, bit. exactly judge the room. But um, if there's some a general game tabletop gaming convention that has board games and card games and miniatures and RPGs and whatever, then you can go there and sign up to be a game master for that convention. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't think of a local convention of that style that does not like to have people sign up to run events. That's really that right. that's what makes those things work. Exactly. Yeah. So you you sign up to be a GM, and and I've done this in the past a bunch of times. Again, going back to miniatures, I have gone to uh, local conventions and said, okay, I'm going to run a game called Song of Blades and Heroes, which is written by uh, an Italian fellow, uh, but it's in English, uh, and that is a very simple but elegant. Um, game it's fantasy skirmish 
it's very easy to teach, mm-hmm. but it is a lot of fun and has a lot of kind of options and things that you can do and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I bring, like, I am I play all the bad guys on the board. Okay. So I have all these skeletons okay. that I've painted, and that I, actually another friend of mine has painted a bunch of them as well. Um, but, I, you know, there's, those are all the painted fancy skeletons, and so I control all the skeletons. All right. But the, the players that I'm playing against, they each have a small war band, and those models are... Um, like Pathfinder and D and D, and sometimes even Hero Clicks style models, where they're pre paints, they're that kind of more slightly rubbery plastic. Okay, sure, yeah. Uh, and if you get Cheeto dust all over them, or whatever, or spill Mountain mm-hmm. Dew on them, I can just literally throw them in the sink and clean them off, and it's fine. That, that's nice. Which yes. I don't do with my nice skeletons and all that stuff. So I run the skeletons and the undead, and then these different groups of heroes have been now taught the game, and then they're coming in trying to kill as many skeletons mm-hmm. as possible and take out the Necromancer. And it's I can bring everything. It comes. It's a small setup. It plays like on a three by three or four by four. I can't remember right off the top of my head. I think it might be a four by four, um, but it could easily run on a three by three. And it is also like if you've only got two people who are interested in playing, then I reduce the number of skeletons. If I've got four people interested in playing, I have a, enough war bands for I think at least up to four. And then I bring you know the the right amount of skeletons. Sure. Okay. And you try to not crush the new players like right <laughs> off the bat you try not to be like hey am i teaching this new game and then just step on their neck you don't min max it yeah no no i help. generally try to not have as many skeletons as i think i might need to win and then that way it kind of they have a good time right they might lose a person or something like that out of their group but still they win the day or whatever the deal mm-hmm. is and it's great and it teaches people who've generally never played a miniatures game before how to do that. like i'm not so much there to teach them hey you should really be playing song of blades and heroes though it is a great game i'm there teaching them this is what a miniature game is like. This okay. is what a miniature war game is like. And so um, you can also just be an advocate for that. Like maybe maybe like there aren't enough people playing RPGs in your area. Everybody right. plays miniatures and nobody ever plays RPGs. So even going in there and just playing D&D, even though it's the most popular RPG, it's still not a popular game mm-hmm. within your local area. And now you're trying to teach people. So just because a game is popular within a genre doesn't mean that its genre is That's popular true, yeah. in a local area. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any other kind of thoughts on what people can do in this in this situation when their game is not the popular one or if they want to get more people to start playing the game that they like that isn't getting played as much as they would like? Uh, I think we hit most of the main points. Uh, you know, and recap, you know, talking to your store owner. Mm-hmm. Uh, looking at uh, any kind of you know local postings to see if there's other people around your area like game for it. Mm-hmm. Um, having enough for multiple people to try out the game. Yeah. Uh, they could also uh, contact the publisher, right? Yeah, that's right. We kind of did, but there are many publishers will have something known as a demo team. They will frequently add some sort of name. Like I used to be on the demo team for a game called Golem Arcana. And the demo team that we were referred to as emissaries, mm-hmm. and I know that the demo team for the Malifaux game they're referred to as henchmen. You know, so nice. there's yep. a yep. lot of these game companies because they're creative folks. They've got these kind of crazy names for for their demo team. But what these people do is they go to generally local stores in their region, right. sometimes traveling a good distance, and then they run events at these local stores to teach people about this game. And then the generally the reason they do it is because then they get like either discounts on stuff from the publisher or sometimes they even get like credit which then they can use to buy stuff from Mm -hmm. the publisher that kind of jazz um so if you do really want to go like if you're just just besides just like oh i want to get people in here to do this right you can really go to town and you know become like this can become an an extra part of your hobby right that can then also help to to some degree pay for your hobby to some degree a little bit yeah. yeah so um that's another thing to actually to look at too about like once you've gone beyond just straight up advocate right. becoming part of an actual demo team for a publisher that's is another kind of the next go. level absolutely. exactly yep. absolutely all right well i think we've got that mostly covered i think so i think so um, but uh yeah if we, if we didn't cover something or if you oh, have yeah. better tips you know please let us know because yeah definitely reach out and uh, we're always having people ask us how to find stuff and yeah exactly and, and 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 take a look at the app as well i mean definitely go through there look through you're looking for players uh, and if you don't find anybody in your region who's looking to play that specific game that you're into, um, then post your own. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because, yeah, there might be, I, we've had it, some areas where, you know, we've been told there's nobody playing this game. Right. So I'm not going to make a post. And then we get one of them to finally do it. And then five other people join in and they're like, oh, I didn't realize that that was even a chance for everyone to play. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the games that we've seen. 
I know I've seen a lot of Age of Sigmar. I've had a lot of people tell me about, oh, I was just, I found a game, I found three people to play Age of Sigmar with because I used, I posted on LFP. Mm-hmm. Because not everybody necessarily wants to make the first step even just to post on LFP. Right. So, you know, putting in that looking for players thing is also, I think, a big deal. But, yeah. All right. I think that'll do it for this week. Absolutely. Uh, thanks again for listening to this episode of the Game 4 Podcast. If you've got any questions or comments and you're watching on YouTube, uh, please leave a comment below. If you're listening via your favorite podcast player, you're just not into the whole YouTube comment section thing, then you can feel free to reach out to us via email at podcast at iamgame4.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And lastly, to find out more about the Game 4 platform designed to connect tabletop gamers, please check out our website at www.iamgame4.com. That is www.iamgamf. Nope, I screwed that up. There's an E in there. Uh, I-A-M-G-A-M-E-F-O-R.com. Thanks.